everybody. Welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Today we're going to be taking all your nutritional questions. So if you've got questions you'd like to have me answer today, make sure you pump those into the chat or the feed um, to the left or below uh, the video. Now, um, if you missed Tuesday's show, you might want to go back and take a look at that. We did a walk through the history of grain and what you need to know about why grain may be different today and uh, what are the dangers and the pitfalls. Uh, but also, just from the historical perspective, a lot of people um, get this so wrong because they don't understand the history of it. So I'd encourage you to go back and look at that. I think it'll give you great insight as to um, how to navigate the gluten-free diet much better and why you're doing it. So, all that being said, we also have, I think this week is our, what do we have, Mel? We've got uh, a sale. Uh, 50% off. Yeah. Store. No code needed. No code needed. Okay, so this, uh, and, and is that, does that have an expiration date? Uh, do, do, do. I don't have it on here. Okay, so, well, at any rate, I know it's at least good through Christmas. So, hey, those of you who want to support us and you want to use our products, um, whether it's a, a vitamin mineral supplementation or any of our herbal blends or any of our lab testing where we test for food sensitivities and nutritional deficiencies or gluten sensitivity, um, you can save 15% off now through Christmas. Again, that's our Christmas sale. I encourage you to take advantage of that. You don't need a promo code, so you just go to glutenfreesociety.org, hit the shop button, and you can peruse through our catalog of offerings. So, but don't forget if you're if you're trying to save some money, that's going on through Christmas. All right, let's dive in. What's the difference between nitrite? I mean, nitrite like they use in some meat and sulfite from wine. Well, they're two different substances altogether. They're both preservatives, but in the meats, they generally tend to use uh, nitrites. Nitrites are there's some evidence that they're potential carcinogens, and so that's not something that I encourage anyone to um, to eat. So if you've got meat, for example, that's preserved with the nitrites, um, you know you can find plenty of them that aren't. Now there are some natural forms of nitrite, like celery juice and celery powder, which um, don't come with that same kind of risk. So that would be an exception. Whereas sulfites, again, are chemicals typically added to wine. In the U.S., we add a lot more sulfite to the wine than we do, say, than they do in Europe. Uh, and again, these are chemical preservatives that a lot of people can't metabolize very well and have severe type of histaminic-like responses to. Um, a lot of people with sulfite reactions actually do really well when they supplement with molybdenum, which is a mineral uh, that can help in the, in the fundamental breakdown of sulfites. So if you, if you find yourself, you know, reacting to sulfites or suspecting that you react to sulfites, you might also consider supplementing. Is it possible to take a detox bath in city tap water without filtering it? I hear of detox baths, but how is it that possible with what's in the city water these days? Same question for doing dishes in the tap water. I feel like I'm sensitive to washing. Is there more to that commentary, Mel? To washing dishes by hand with no window ventilation and inhalation of tap water by doing so. Yeah, so I mean, TC, great questions on, on water. I, I don't know how you would do a detox bath if you're using city water and not filtering it. I mean, the city water, beyond the fact that most city waters add chlorines, bromines or chloramines and fluoride. Um, there's also been ample evidence. Um, there was a study done, it's maybe close to 15 years or so ago. It was reported on by the Associated Press, so it was a big, big major news story, but major cities across the U.S., and, I, and I'm sure this is probably true uh, of other industrialized countries in major cities, but like, for example, in Houston, where I live, there they identified 42 different prescription medications in the water. And this is after the city's filters. So how do you detox when you've got all these different chemicals in the water? Well, the best way is to filter your water. A whole house filtration system is what I recommend. And that way, as the water comes into your house, it's being properly filtered. Two of the best types of filters for whole house 
are what are called granular activated carbon, sometimes referred to as GAC carbon. And uh, another filter medium that's, that's a zinc and copper alloy, it's called KDF. K is in kangaroo, D is in dog, F is in frank, KDF. So carbon, GAC carbon and KDF, two great uh, mediums to filter a whole house system. And they're very easy to install, you, you know, a number of different companies. There's not like one great company only. There are a lot of different great companies that can install whole house filtration using those two filter mediums. But highly recommend that you do that if you're trying to protect yourself from the potential of water, especially if you're taking baths. Uh, Jessica asks, which probiotic from Gluten-Free Society does someone need to take after using antibiotics post-surgically? So if you've been, if you've been in the hospital and had a surgery, um, generally what happens is they give you an antibiotic as a prophylactic to prevent the potential for infection. And so which probiotic would you take after that fact to support yourself? Um, Ultrabiotic defense is the one, Jessica. So ultrabiotic defense, maybe we can put a link up for her on that one. That's a heavy hitter. It's a high dose probiotic. You know, um, we guarantee in that particular probiotic, you know, after, you know, we have a two year shelf life on it, but if that product is two years old, the day of the expiration, we guarantee the potency of over 200 billion colony forming units in that one. So. Uh, that's the, the probiotic that we recommend for people in that situation. Is organic wild rice and organic black rice good with a gluten-free diet to consume? If you're talking about organic wild rice, true wild rice is not grain, so yeah, it would be okay. Um, organic black rice I mean, depending, because there's acronym, or not acronym, they're, they're kind of different names for black rice, but if it's not a wild, if it's not a true wild rice, because some black rices are actually wild rices and some are not, so it, it depends on which one you're buying. So you, you've got to get clarity on it because not all organic black rice would be good, but organic black wild rice, that's, that would be a different matter. So look for the delineation of wild. Okay. Dr. Osmond, what's your opinion on modified cornstarch? Some products use that instead of wheat gluten, but what's modified? Are the Zane gluten out or not? Thanks for your continued support. Um, I don't recommend modified cornstarch. If you're trying to go on a true gluten-free diet, um, no corn. I mean, I don't recommend any corn in the, in the product. So if it's got corn syrup or corn starch, um, or maltodextrin derived from corn, uh, even even the hard liquors that, you know, like bourbons and whiskeys that sometimes are, well, not whiskeys, but I think it's bourbon that's made from corn. Um, I don't recommend those, even though they technically are supposed to ha have all the, the, the um, protein filtered out of them through the distillation process. I still don't recommend them because of the experience where I've seen people clinically react to them regardless. Um, not sure I understand this question. Can spa and bulging disc occur at the same time? Clarify what you mean by spa. Is that, is, are you using that as an acronym, a medical acronym for something else? Or is it a misspell? Um, uh, which therapy would you recommend for a bulging disc if someone cannot heal with exercise? There's a lot of different therapies that can be used for bulging disc. Depending on the location of the disc, you can have, um, you know, if it's lumbar, uh, or if it's cervical or thoracic, you know, there's traction, which is a, a good therapy for bulging discs. And then there's specialized types of traction um, called decompression. So spinal decompression therapies, which are just a more advanced type of traction can, can be better than traction. And then there are also um, things like cold level, level lasers that can be used as well. There's chiropractic care that can work extremely well for bul bulging discs. Um, there are a number of different exercise uh, modalities or methodologies. Um, McKenzie, M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E, -E, McKenzie exercises for bulging discs can be very effective. Um, so those are all potential options for you. 
But the other thing I would, I would highly encourage looking at would be um, your nutrition. I mean, if you're, if you, for example, if you have a zinc or vitamin C deficiency, healing a disc can be very, very challenging because in order to that disc to heal, you need those nutrients to form the disc. As far as ozone and PRP, platelet-rich plasma, those can be helpful. But I find that um, PRP and stem cells are generally only as effective as a person's nutrition is solid. So, so um, if, you're, if your nutrition is poor, the, my experience in people that do PRP and stem cells, their outcomes are not great if their nutrition is poor. If their nutrition is really good, then their outcomes with PRP and, and stem cells can be much better. Okay, Jessica's asking for clar- clarification on how to take intestinal defense. If you're, if you're taking it preventatively, you would take two capsules a day. If you suspect that you actually have a worm, you would take four caps a day. So the, the, the difference between two and four caps a day would, would be the circumstance that you're in, whether you think you actually have a worm or parasite versus you're just trying to be preventative and take it as a preventative. So two caps for preventative, four for more therapeutic. I've, uh, let's see here, I have very high vitamin B12 levels and raised amylase for many years and my ERS is elevated. You mean your ESR? Maybe that's a typo. Uh, Do you know what can cause this? So you have an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is a marker for systemic inflammation. You have a raised elevated amylase, which is a pancreatic enzyme that can be indicative of pancreatitis or inflammation of your pancreas, and you have high vitamin B12 levels. Well, as far as why you have high vitamin B12, if you're supplementing with any kind of B12 at all, it's very easy to have high serum vitamin B12 levels. It doesn't mean that you're toxic. It just means that B12 can enter the serum very readily from the intestine. But you have systemic inflammation, and it looks like you have pancreatic inflammation potentially, so certainly you want to talk to your doctor about you know, about what you can do. But in my experience with systemic inflammation, especially where it, where it relates to the pancreas, gluten can be a major contributing factor, Angel. So if you're not already gluten and grain-free, that would be a great first step to support your health with just diet change alone. But uh, I would argue you probably need to get deeper. You probably need to understand why that inflammation is happening as, as opposed to just me giving you kind of a generic um, template to, to, to attempt to follow. Uh, but, you know, again, the best generic template I could give you beyond going grain-free is to follow the no-grain, no-pain diet and see if your, your amylase comes down and your ESR comes down. And if they do, great, problem solved. But if they don't, you, re- you really should be working with a doctor to understand why those things are elevated. Uh, scroll down just a little bit on that feed. Uh, hand washing dishes at work. Is it possible that it could be making me not feel well um, or contributing to toxic overload just by inhalation? I can smell the water at times, no window to open. My boss says when she can afford it, she's willing to get reverse osmosis water. You know, it's possible. Um, I personally don't do well with, with chloramine in the water. Um, so depend, again, depending on the, the, what's in that water, uh, for me, if, I, if I'm overexposed to chloramine through gaseous hot water or through just direct skin exposure, uh, I, don't, I don't do very well. So it's definitely possible that that could be contributing to you not feeling well, especially if you correlate it with you know, each time you're doing those dishes. Uh, uh, part two of Jessica's question, how much of the ultrabiotic defense? Uh, one packet a day is sufficient, Jessica. Can I put vitamin C powder in Blendtec blender or will I disturb the breakdown in the composition? No, you can, you can put it in a blender just fine. What you don't want to do with the vitamin C powder is mix it 
and then slowly drink it over the course of the day. Once you, once you expose that powder to air and light, it's going to begin its oxidation process where, the, in other words, it's going to start deteriorating the second you expose it to that light and air. So if you're putting it in a blender, you know, for like a food smoothie or putting it in a glass of water, drink it immediately. Don't, don't pre-mix the whole amount for the day. I've had some people come back and say, yeah, I've I mixed all of my vitamin C for the, in, my, in my gallon jug of water and then I sipped on that all through the course of the day. That's not the best way to add vitamin C to your water. Um, you want to do it where it's fresh, as fresh as in coming right out of the bottle. Can a dose of 600 milligrams of NAC uh, twice a day cause diarrhea? Is it best to take NAC morning, lunch, evening, and not with food? Taking it for congestion lungs. You could take it with or without food, Dorian. It just depends on whether you can tolerate it on an empty stomach. Most people can tolerate it on an empty stomach, but some can't, and in that regard, take it with food. But as far as the timing, whether it's morning, lunch, or evening, that, that's not really... Um, super relevant as far as getting the timing down. It's just a matter of getting it into your system and, and keeping it into your system for long periods of time to help you uh, with that mucolytic effect. And, and as far as can it cause diarrhea, it, it's not a typical side effect of NAC. Some people, you know, do have GI upset with NAC and so, you know, it's, it's unique to the person. So, but I would say it's, it's not a common symptom of NAC having diarrhea. Uh, go back up just a little bit there. Um, let's see. Diagnosed with AF stage 1 and told to sleep, have less stress, and take cortisol manager. Um, but if my cortisol is already low, will that make it worse? Just take B5. How much? Vitamin C and zinc. Please help. Um, if you're talking about AF stage 1, if, that, if you're referring to adrenal fatigue is what I'm assuming you're meaning, Christine. Um, you know, I don't know what's in cortisol manager. So without, without a list of ingredients to look at, it's hard for me to, to comment about, you know, it making it worse, but some products that are designed to support adrenal function have what are called adaptogens in them and adaptogens, whether your cortisol is high or low adaptogens will help kind of bring it to a normalized type of state. So that's why they're called adaptogens because they work whether your levels are high or low. Um, now, if your levels are really high and you're taking something like, um, like an, a glandular, which glandular is the actual meat of the adrenal glands in encapsulated forms, um, a glandular might overstimulate you. Some people with high adrenals already, when they take a glandular, they, they actually feel more anxiety and more anxious and they don't do well with it. So, you know, if it's, again, if it's, if it's more of an adaptogen like ashwagandha, then you should be okay, you know, whether, whether your cortisol levels are high or low as far as supporting your adrenal function. And then vitamin B5 and C are always good ideas. If you've been told your adrenals are, are, are not up to speed, um, you know, 500 milligrams of pentothenic acid, vitamin C, and, you know, anywhere as much as 5 to 20 grams of vitamin C a day, just depending on your bowel tolerance. But um, both are fantastic support for adrenal function. Can I put vitamin C powder? Okay, I answered that one. Um, my trip taste level is 10.6. Is more indicative of histamine tolerance, mast cell activation. My, uh, you know, I don't know what it's more indicative of, but just looking at trip taste is not would not be the end all be all of what I would do to try to assess whether or not somebody had histamine intolerance. You should probably have your diamine oxidase levels measured. Um, your total histamine levels measured as well would be helpful. Um, in terms of trying to assess whether or not you have a histamine intolerance and then looking at like your DAO histamine ratios um, would also be helpful. But, you know, histamine can come from 
a lot of different places. Like we have immune cells that produce histamine in response to environmental allergens or environmental immune exposures. And so you could have a, a, an environmental allergy, you know, and that could be anything from like cedar to, to ragweed to outdoor molds, etc. cetera. Um, you could also be allergic to foods and that can cause histamine or histaminic types of responses. And you could also have or eat foods that are high in histamine, and these are generally the the, the older the food is, the, the the more leftover a food is, so to say. Generally speaking, the more histamine potential it's going to have. Hamid, I, I would highly encourage you to check out our class on histamine, um, and that I think will be very helpful for you to to kind of do a deeper dive in this. As far as if you have a negative IgE and a, and a negative LRA rice reaction, can you have rice? Not if you're gluten sensitive. I mean, I don't recommend rice for people that are gluten sensitive. So uh, it, I don't know if you've had your genetics tested for gluten sensitivity, but if you really want to know whether your whether your gluten sensitive uh, predisposition is 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 there, you really should get genetic testing. It's the best way to know whether or not avoiding all forms of grain is, is the right move in your diet. Would you recommend for someone with Hashimoto's, I'm on 75 mics, uh, micrograms, I don't want to stay on medication for the rest of my life. You gotta work with the doctor, Suzanne, to really figure out why, um, you, know, you know, why you have Hashimoto's. I mean, Hashimoto's has triggers, and certainly gluten is a major trigger for Hashimoto's, but other things can as well. I mean, food, chemical exposures, microbes, and nutritional deficiencies can all be a part of Hashimoto's. I mean, there's, a, there's ample research on inositol and selenium in combination, lowering the antibodies in people with Hashimoto's. Um, there's evidence on iodine deficiency. I mean, there's just a lot of things that are going on there that you should probably have investigated at a deeper level if you really, really want to get to the bottom of it. And if your goal is to get off of medicine, then you've got to do that deeper investigation. Can I take magnesium, zinc, copper, iron, B12, folate, or, or folic acid together, or is it better to separate them for better absorption? No, you can take them all together, but I would never take folic acid, Christian. Folic acid's synthetic folate, and it's not good. If you're going to use folate, you need to use um, true folate, so like um, methyl, methyl folate or a methylated version of folate or a calcium uh, folate would be better options than the synthetic folic acid. Uh, Suzanne's asking about what would some testing be? I would encourage you, Suzanne, we have a crash course on nutrition in the thyroid. Start with that. It's a, you know, it goes through a lot of the different things that you can have measured. Um, and that might be a super great place for you to start getting educated around how your thyroid actually functions and what nutritionally is, is necessary for it to be healthy. Maybe we can put that link up for her. What would you suggest for chronic pain? Um, generically speaking, follow no grain, no pain, Jerry. Um, that absolutely following that diet and looking at I also spell out a number of the different supplements that can be very helpful for pain in the book as well um, you know because there are a lot of nutrients that are supportive of, of a healthy inflammation response like high doses of omega-3 and quercetin and something called SPMs I mean there's just a number of different things that can be done there um, if, you know, more particularly what I would suggest is that you work with some type of functional practitioner who knows how to properly test you so that they can give you specific advice as opposed to generalized, but those are just good places you could start. Uh, let's see here. How would I test for Lyme? I, I don't recommend Lyme testing unless you've had an, a, a known tick bite and unless you've already changed your diet according um, to, you know, functional testing. And the reason why is so many people have positive Lyme antibodies but that don't have Lyme, 
because there's a molecular mimicry that can occur with food allergens and Lyme antibodies. And so if you haven't first changed your diet and dialed your diet into you know, your own unique needs, you can get a false positive on a Lyme test. And you know a lot of doctors, the way they like to treat Lyme is with years of antibiotics. And that's a very, very, in my opinion, risky proposition because antibiotics will wipe out your good flora, can cause B vitamin deficiency, excuse me, B vitamin deficiencies among other problems. And so it's one of those where the risk benefit ratio is really high. And um, again, I, I, would, I would suggest looking at food before you even endeavor into the Lyme arena, unless you've got like direct evidence of a Lyme bite with, you know, with bullseye rash or direct evidence of, of the development of fever or illness shortly after some type of tick bite. I like that. You're in a short sleeve shirt. I'm in two layers. Merry Christmas, Dr. Osborne. Enjoy the warmth. Yeah, that's Texas, man. We 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 were 30 degrees a few weeks ago, and now we're now we're like 70 degrees. So it's up down here. What would you recommend for someone who has non-celiac gluten sensitivity disease? In what regard? What do you mean? What would I recommend? I'd recommend a lot of things, um, but I would recommend them depending on what a person was dealing with, Deanna. So if you have a specific question around the, you know, what I would recommend in, in regard to what. Um, I, I give you some generic things. So if you have a celiac diagnosis or even a non-celiac gluten sensitivity diagnosis, I, I would encourage you obviously to stay grain free, but as far as nutrition supplementation, kind of three of the best things you could take just out of the gates, just kind of just being as preventative minded as possible is uh, Ultra Nutrients, which is our multivitamin formulation along with um, Biotic Defense, as well as um, Omega, our Ultra Omega. We have, we have um, I think it's called, I don't know what, it's a bundle, but it's a, it's, it's a bundle, it's a discount bundle that you can check out. It's our gluten-free starter pack, I think, or starter kit, or maybe it's our gluten-free essentials. That's what it is, um, our gluten-free essentials, and you can check that out, Deanna. Currently have COVID, what nutrients should I be putting in my body in dose? Um, let's post for Spirit, um, our immune protocol. Uh, that Spirit, we have, um, it's typed up already. It's on, you can find it at Gluten Free Society if you, if you type in immune protocol in the search box, but we're gonna put a link up below for you um, and you can check that out. But the nutrients that we recommend are right there. Uh, and there's several of them. Is castor oil effective for upper abdominal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? I wouldn't rely on using castor oil to try to treat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, could you use it as an adjuvant to just support good health and detoxification? Yeah, you could. But um, if you've got if you've got non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you're probably gluten sensitive. That's one of the cancers associated with gluten sensitivity. You really need to be grain free, and you really need to do a deeper dive on. Um, on whether or not you have other food reactions, whether or not you have any kind of intestinal dysbiosis, um, whether or not you have any other chemical triggers or whether you have any other nutritional deficiency triggers. Could TC get a filter on the shower and fill the tub that way for a detox bath? Yes, they make shower head filters that have carbon KDF in them. And that would be another option as far as a, a, a good call, good call on that one. That would be another option for a detox bath if you don't have a whole house filter yet. It's just that fill your bathtub up with your shower head. What does that mean? Can we expect an update on no grain, no pain? What do you mean? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that and expect an update. You mean like a, 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 a second publication where I add to the book or, you know, again, I'm not sure what you mean by that question, but um, the book is just as relevant today as it was when it was published. So at, at this point, I mean, if I were adding to it purely to add to it, you know, I, I certainly could. There's, there's more research that's come out since I published it. But I don't have any immediate plans to do an update uh, in any time in the in the immediate near future. Is it true that Boswellia has similar effect to steroids? Trying to stay away from prednisone, Boswellia's impact on on inflammation 
is it's what's called a LOX inhibitor, um, Dorian. What that means, a LOX stands for lipooxygenase. It's a, it's a constituent of cell membranes that can contribute to inflammation when a cell is damaged. And so taking Boswellia has a, a, an inhibitory effect on that cascade. And so in that regard, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. And we actually use Boswellia with white willow now, I have a product called White Willow Complex that has both Boswellia and White Willow in it because Boswellia inhibits LOX, lipooxygenase, and White Willow inhibits COX, cyclooxygenase. And these are two of the inflammatory cascade pathways. So taking them together, there's a synergism. Now, if you're trying to take something that has kind of a similar... Uh, inflammation support as a steroid, you can mix vitamin C with quercetin. And so combining about five grams of vitamin C with three to four grams of quercetin, um, that works biochemically in the same, in a, well, not in the same, but in a similar way as a steroid for natural inflammation support. So, um, you know, those are both things you could do. My son's fiance is 24 and struggling with brain fog and neck pain, also struggles with acne, trying to encourage her to go gluten-free. Yeah, give her a copy of No Grain, No Pain for Christmas. Um, you know, if she's struggling, that's great. That's not great that she's struggling, but it, it's, it is great that she's struggling because usually when people are willing to make the, the biggest changes in their health are when they're struggling the most. So to me, I... I and it sounds, it sounds contradictory, but I love it when people are struggling because that means they're the most open to making meaningful change. And when they're not struggling, they generally tend to put their head in the sand and ignore the bad behaviors that they have. And so the disease, you know, the underlying illness and inflammation just continues to progress unchecked. So catch them when they're in pain. That's, that's the best time to get them to take action. Thoughts on food grade diatomaceous earth to do a cleanse? Yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do a cleanse with. It, you know, if I if I'm recommending a cleanse, usually what I'll recommend is using a vitamin C, high dose vitamin C to do a vitamin C flush. Um, that's not to say you can't use diatomaceous earth. It's just not one I'm 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 not as comfortable with that. Um, and vitamin C has far greater effect in my opinion than diatomaceous earth. Is tapioca okay and safe? in your opinion. It can be. Um, if you're not allergic to tapioca or cassava, it can be just fine. Where people go wrong with tapioca is quantity. Um, it's high glycemic, so when you're eating it, it you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it can be a lot of carbohydrate sugars that flood into your system. So my advice with tapioca is, is to eat it sparingly and to eat it reasonably, like eat reasonable amounts. Um, you know, there's a lot of products where they use tons of tapioca to make like different types of bread or cereal products. And so when you, when you go eat a ton of that stuff, what you're really doing is you're just ramping up your blood sugar and creating potential for blood sugar problems. So again, it is gluten-free, it is grain-free, but you know, quantity within reason, and I wouldn't use it as a staple food. Does it make a difference if wheat is sprouted? I'm guessing I have wishful thinking. You're very right in that guess. Sprouted wheat is still got gluten in it. Um, so that, you know, if you, if you are buying like an Ezekiel sprouted type grain-based bread, it's not gluten-free. Um, and, and although it might be more healthy overall than let's say just like a processed loaf of bread, if you're gluten sensitive, um, you shouldn't eat Ezekiel or any other sprouted types of bread or bread products. Are sorghum and millet okay to eat? Um, no, sorghum's a grain. Um, it has a type of gluten in it. Um, millet, also a grain, has a type of gluten in it as well. So no, no, neither of those would be things I would recommend if you're trying to follow a true gluten-free diet. Again, they will be labeled gluten-free because the definition of gluten per government uh, regulation is is only really in reference to wheat, barley, and rye, but sorghum and millet do have different forms of gluten in them that can cause inflammation, uh, and we've seen a number of people react to them over the years, so just not recommended. Should I quit rice even after a normal intestinal biopsy report? 
I still feel tired and have OCD problems and gluten-free diet having diagnosed with celiac 10 years ago. Yeah, if you're celiac and you're still eating rice, you're, you, you know, you're just not going to feel better. That's just been my experience in, 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 in dealing with folks. So highly would recommend you be grain-free, not, not, again, we use two, two terminologies for those of you maybe who are new. Um, there's the traditional gluten-free diet, which is kind of the traditional definition is wheat, barley, and rye-free. And then there's the true gluten-free diet, which is free of all grains and all pseudo-grains. Do we have a link to, um, it's the list of foods to avoid on a gluten-free diet. I want to put that up for everybody because this question's coming up a lot today. And we'll put a link below and there's just this master list of things that if you're trying to follow along on a true gluten-free diet, you should be avoiding these things. My mom has been suffering with rheumatoid arthritis there's longitudinal ridging on her nails, and now her hands, skin, has been losing its elasticity and wrinkles are appearing on her hands. What can she do? No grain, no pain would be the first step in the right direction. The, the amount of RA I've seen reverse with the no grain, no pain diet, I mean, it's just, it, it's a weekly event in my practice. So um, that, that would be hands down the first simplest piece of advice that I could, that I could encourage you guys to do. Can we use your tests on dogs? Um, you know, probably, but it's not something that um, I'm not a vet, and the tests are not really designed for dogs, so it's not it's not something that I would encourage you to spend a lot of money on because I, I don't know that we could, you know, say that we have great validation on outcomes by testing other species beyond humans. IBS, wheat allergy, non-celiac, gluten sensitive. So what can you eat? Meats, vegetables, nuts, fruit. There's a lot to eat. I think a lot of people, when they, when they initially kind of come on it, most people think that their diets are rich with variety. And what they don't even realize is the vast majority of things they're eating are just basically amalgamations of different types of grains. You know, breads, pastas, cereals, sandwiches, etc. And so... A lot of people have this perception that there's, they're missing out on the diversity of their diet when, those, when you get those types of diagnoses. And re, for the reality is, there are hundreds of meats, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and varieties and recipes that you can embark on, Deanna. And I would just encourage you, if you're, if you're new to all this and you're really struggling, check out our recipe page at Gluten Free Society. We could put a link up below for you. Um, there's 300 some odd recipes there that will get you going in the right direction and give you tons of food ideas as well. My mother has a, or had a second opinion on her knee and now finally the MRI has been taken. Her knee has arthros grade three, but she still takes NAC. Like you said, it helps with pain if surgery can can be postponed. Not sure if there's a question in that, more just commentary. If someone doesn't have the genes of gluten sensitivity, is going grain-free a loss of time or less of a priority? No, not necessarily for many other reasons. Like you may not be gluten sensitive genetically, but you may be reacting to the pesticides in grain, or you may be reacting to the mold or the mycotoxins commonly found that are contaminated in grain. There are also heavy metals that are found in grain that some people react to. Um, there's also the, the omega-6, omega-3 imbalance of grain as a staple food, and there's also the excessive quantity of carbs in grain. And so a lot of people do well going off of grain for all those other reasons, even if they don't have gluten sensitivity. I always say if you don't have the gluten sensitive genes, and you've been properly tested and, and you've shown negative, you know, do embark on a three to six month trial of a grain-free diet and listen to your body. If your body responds in a favorable way, don't let anyone tell you that it's dangerous to not eat grain. There's no scientific evidence that's ever been um, presented that says that humans need grain in their diet as a requirement for good health. And all the rhetoric around you got to have, you know, whole grain fiber, that's that's rhetoric. It's cereal industry garbage. It's not, it's pseudoscience and um, nothing could be further from the truth. You don't need all that. And, and, I and I would say that a lot of the double blind randomized controlled trials coming out on keto and carnivore diets for autoimmune and cancer and other health problems are proving that out to be very, very true. 
my son has developmental delay, um, you got to get him tested. I mean, if he's if, if, if he has developmental delays, you need to get his micronutrient levels tested because it's very possible that he doesn't have the right nutrition to promote the, um, the healthy development of neurological tissue that play a role in the, the delay or the, in the development process. So you definitely, I would look at micronutrient levels. I'd also get him tested for food, food sensitivities, possibly gluten sensitivity, because if he's eating food that his body perceives to be poison, it's going to impact his ability to develop as well. Can you discuss how to raise white and low blood, low red blood cells? I mean, menopause and have had low labs for a couple of years now. You got to find out why they're low. I mean, there, there are certainly, there are certain things that can cause low white and low red cells and that folate deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin B6 deficiency, zinc deficiency, um, you know, other things that can cause those types of low counts, gluten sensitivity can cause low counts mold exposure can cause low count. So getting, you know, appropriately measured for those different things might give you better insight, Laura. I would, I would talk to your doctor about, about doing that. I have high eosinophils and GI inflammation. Uh, more of a comment. So, I mean, high eosinophils and GI inflammation, that, there are a lot of things that could cause that. A parasitic infection could, could potentially cause that. Um, you could get tested for that. Um, you might also have allergies. High eosinophils generally are elevated when people are eating foods they're allergic to, and the eosinophils will infiltrate into the GI tract area, uh, and, and then they'll start to mass release histamine, causing inflammation and irritation. So, generally speaking, the Eosinophils are what are causing the GI inflammation and what's causing the eosinophils to release histamine is generally something you're putting in your mouth if you don't have a parasite or some other type of GI tract imbalance with microbes. So Philip says, celiac with DH, dermatitis herpetiformis, low red blood cells. Doc says, I have low blood due to malnutrition absorption. Also, brain fog and joint pain. Is this a common thing and what's the remedy? Well, if, if you have been gluten grain free and you're still struggling with joint pain and brain fog, yeah, you could have, your doc could be right, you could have nutritional malabsorption that's still present even though you've changed your diet. The, one of the first things I would, I would do is get a micronutrient test where you're looking, uh, looking at vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, and if you know, be very careful about that too, because a lot of doctors don't, they don't have a background in nutrition. They're not experts in nutrition. And so when they do nutritional testing, they're measuring serum test values, which are very misleading and oftentimes just wrong. Um, so you want to get an intracellular test to be as accurate as you can be. And I, we can post a link to, to intracellular testing. So if, you're, if your doctor won't do intracellular testing, you can get that done at Gluten-Free Society. Any treatment besides surgery to improve posture with S-shaped spine from severe scoliosis? Yeah, chiropractic. Um, many chiropractors are, are specialists in severe scoliosis. S-shaped scoliosis, and there are certain types of braces and manipulations that can be done, as well as uh, physical rehab. It's also very important to get your nutrition checked with bad scoliosis, well, with any scoliosis, but with that kind of scoliosis, because um, we see things like magnesium and omega-3 and folate deficiencies that can contribute to the to the um, prolongation of scoliosis or the resistance to treatment of scoliosis. So, uh, you know, I would look at all those things. Let's see here. Can you recommend a supplement for heart palpitations? I've had them for months. Um, you know, you could attempt 
just pure magnesium or CalMag, Joe, um, and that you know potentially could be helpful. But my experience with people that have heart palpitations that are not responsive to things like calcium, magnesium, or electrolytes is diet change. I mean, a lot of people are reacting to their food and it's, and it's triggering a heart palpitation-like response. I've also seen low oxalate diets be very effective for heart palpitations. Um, oxalates being um, components found in a number of, of uh, plant-based foods and, um, you know, so you might also consider a low oxalate diet along with that, along with a grain-free diet. Love this. Carmen says, Carmen from South Africa, I recommend your channel to everyone since finding it and implementing changes. I noticed many improvements, especially with nerve pain. Thanks for your hard work. You're welcome, Carmen. Thanks for letting us know you're getting better. Our natural ways of parasite cleansing herbals like wormwood and black walnut um, good enough? Yeah, they can be. Um, you know, you can certainly make that attempt. I mean, some of the some of the prescription-based anti-parasitics can be really, really harsh. But you know, well, I would encourage you to work with your doctor if you're going to go that natural route. Work with your doctor um, and be objective about it. You know, so if you if you go on a course of those tinctures that. Um, afterwards, you're rechecking to make sure that, it, that, that they were actually effective. What tests do you recommend for mercury and mold poisoning? Um, are there any that are trusted and can be ordered online? When you're talking about mercury and mold, I don't recommend online tests because those two topics are super complex, Lisa. And you really need guidance. Um, you know, if you, for example, if you had a mercury issue, um, there's a lot of nuance to dealing with that. And there's also a lot of nuance in how you would look at a test and how it would be interpreted. And the same thing can be true of mold. Um, it's just not something I would recommend you, you try and, and, a, and a do it yourself kind of a platform. especially mold because it's, I mean, it can kill you. I mean, you don't, you don't want to mess around. Is castor oil abdominal packs effective for a limit? Yeah, I think I already answered that question. Atrium, let's see, gluten in eggs from a friend who, is that a question? I can't tell if that's a question. It's just misworded maybe. Will gluten shield help? So I ate gluten and eggs, not healthy foods for me. Will gluten shield help? Well, gluten shield is more designed to take before the meal to reduce the potential of, uh, of gluten-induced damage and to reduce the potential from gluten cross-contamination. But it's not really designed, and no product is, and, and, if they, and if they say they're designed so that you can try to eat gluten, they're liars. Uh, and I wouldn't trust that company. If they're, if they're so bold as to unethically say that their digestive enzyme product will protect you from gluten and that it's safe for you to go eat gluten if you take their product, run as far away from them as you possibly can because those people uh, are just trying to sell you and not help you. If you're gluten sensitive, you can use Gluten Shield and, it, and it's a digestive enzyme, but it also has enzymes in it that help to break down gluten. But its intent is only to help you with accidental exposure. If you purposefully eat a pizza, don't expect a lot from gluten shield. It's not going to protect you from that, you know, massive amount of damage you just consumed. It, again, if you're gluten sensitive. Uh, will I do speaking engagements? Yeah. If you, if you want to contact my team on a, on a speaking engagement, you can reach out to Jessica at glutenfreesociety.org. And, uh, and you can inquire with her. But uh, we have certain requirements for speaking engagements. And generally, um, I don't travel a lot these days on purpose. And um, so it's got to be, the speaking engagement has got to definitely be worth the time for the travel. And what that means typically is that there has to be a big enough audience uh, where I'm reaching out and touching enough people. 
Um, otherwise, I can I can do speaking engagements from here and reach you know hundreds of thousands of people, actually millions of people a month. So, but I'm I'm happy to do something like that if if if, if you want to reach out for the inquiry, um, do so with Jessica. If you do not have kidney disease or diabetes, what can be a reason for frequent urination, especially at night? So if you, if you don't have kidney disease or diabetes, drinking reverse osmosis water without adding electrolytes back in can increase nighttime urinary frequency. And mold exposure is a big one. Uh, people that are in mold and being exposed to mycotoxins generally develop severe nighttime urinary frequency issues. Now, if you're a male, you know, prostate enlargement like BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, or even prostate cancers can, you know, can also create an issue. And if you're a female, if you have pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, or pelvic floor muscle weakness, that also may be something that you want to look at as well. What can I do for PMDD? You mean premenstrual dysphoric disorder? Change your diet. PMDD is a dietary dysfunction, um, and there are a lot of reasons why it can happen, but for many women, it's, uh, their carbohydrate intake is way too high. Uh, for some, they, they have fatty acid deficiencies. For others, there's magnesium deficiency that plays a role. Uh, vitamin B6 deficiency can play a role. Progesterone dysfunction can play a role. So you've got to figure out the underlying driving factors for why it exists. Diet change would be the first place I would start with anyone, and that would be the no grain, no pain diet. I love this comment. Just wanted to throw out a big thank you for your continued service. Reducing gluten has resulted in less pain in my knee, shoulder, and elbow. Game changer. Love it. Thanks for sharing, Kitty. Is there a safe way to make myself stop ovulating? I'm 43. Why, why would you want to stop ovulating? Is it, if, if it's because you have the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, figure out what's triggering the dysphoria there. Um, but you don't want to stop ovulating. There's, there's tremendous benefits to a long, healthy fertility age in women. And you, know, you certainly don't want to come up short there. I mean, what we know, and this is true because we, we looked at, at celiac, women with celiac disease, is that celiac is an endocrine, or gluten is an endocrine disruptor and can lead to um, tremendous reduction in fertility and tremendous reduction in fertility um, time. In essence, women will hit our early menopause and late menarche. So, um, you want that, that, that cycle to be healthy and as long as your body is healthy, it's actually a sign of, of, of robustness. So you don't want to stop it early. I mean, there are certainly there are birth control pills that I've seen that, you know, you've probably all seen the commercials where I, I, it just baffles me every time I hear it. It's, there's no, the, the commercial and I quote says, there's no medical reason to have a period. And I just, I think, how do they get away with that? Like, there's no medical reason to have a period. In other words, all of God's wisdom on women's bodies, and we can just declare that that's not necessary, that a cycle, a hormone cycle, is absolutely not necessary for a woman, and just take these drugs and suppress it, and you're still going to be fine at the end of the day. I think it's a ridiculous notion. So you don't, I don't recommend that you try to suppress your cycle with, with drugs. How can I increase my estrogen safely? I have ADA, any drug antibodies, disease, and react to all synthetic drugs. I mean, if you want to increase your estrogen, well, first, I, the first question I would ask is, are you sure it's low? Have you had it measured? Um, I've, I've seen a lot of women think they have low estrogen because they have the symptoms that line up with low estrogen, but they, you know, when actually being measured, they really don't. Um, 
So that would be that would be question number one. Uh, but the other way, you know, if you're just talking about what nutrients are necessary to help your body produce estrogen, you know, fat. A lot of women are are, are low fat, and so they don't actually produce enough hormones. Going gluten free as well. Um, very important part, grain-free specifically, because, you know, again, grains can be estrogen disruptors and endocrine disruptors. So um, change of diet, make sure you're eating enough fat, um, especially fat with cholesterol, because cholesterol is the mother hormone. It's the precursor to directly being able to help your body make estrogen. So looking at all those things would be important. Do you know of a research article that gives credit to the harmfulness of food dyes in medication? Um, I, I would say probably one of the doctors I would say deserves the most credit in that arena, Tammy, is um, Dr. Fine. Let's see. Um, now, now I'm, I'm, I just had a brain fart here. Apologize. Dr. Fine Gold. I, there's a lot of Dr. Fine somethings, Feinstein, et cetera, but it's Dr. Feingold um, was an early pioneer of recognizing that food dyes uh, were very problematic, especially in children. And so you might, he's got a whole battery of work you can go look up, but, but check out Dr. Feingold on food dyes. I went from thinking I need double knee replacement uh, pain throughout with autoimmune disorder. Your advice uh, was a godsend, Dr. O. I'm doing very well now. I love it. Love it. Keep the stories, the positive stories coming. I've got inflammation, high eosinophils, low iron folate, no parasites, no celiac, no H. pylori, no other effect, affection, infections, I assume you mean, or problems. I think I have cortisol resistance. Any advice? Your problems are way too big. If, you're having, if you have all that, um, you need to get with an expert, and you need to get some testing done, Christy. Um, there's not, there's not going to be a generic piece of advice I can give you. If you've got all that going on, you're most likely, even though you're not celiac, you're most likely gluten sensitive, or what we would call non-celiac gluten sensitivity. You also most likely have a battery of different food reactions, even beyond gluten, that's triggering a lot of those things to happen for you. And so the only really way you're going to get definitive in that is to get the right kind of testing done. What do you think of oats? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't recommend them if you're trying to follow a gluten-free, true gluten-free diet. I don't. I, I think oats are going to be problematic for you. Same thing with buckwheat, amaranth, quinoa, corn, rice, millet, sorghum. You know, it's not just wheat, wheat, barley, and rye. I had a blood test recently for. Food allergies tested positive for wheat antibodies with an IgG test. Does that qualify as gluten sensitive? No, it does not. Um, it qualifies for wheat IgG sensitivity, but doesn't qualify for gluten. Can H. pylori treatment increase nausea? Yes, it can. Please explain why the blood tests are so inaccurate compared to intracellular testing. Um, because a blood test can be impacted by your last meal or by whatever you're supplementing with. Intracellular testing, um, well, there's, there's, two, there's two things. Well, there's more than two. Actually, we have an entire um, lecture series on this very topic. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of that, of that video, Mel. It was the one we did a, a few weeks ago on nutrition. This is from Module 7. It was a... You know the one I'm talking about? So um, we're going to post that up for you so that you can do the whole deep dive. But, I mean, the two biggest things are um, serum testing is not a reflection of your cell's ongoing need, and serum testing is a reflection of a standard deviation bell curve. So when they're, when they're giving you a reference range on a serum lab test, they're comparing you to other people who aren't you. And so the difference with intracellular testing is, is, is that it's a functional outcomes test based on your ability of your own cells to be able to grow. So when we, when we do intracellular testing, we're actually measuring the growth rate of your cells, and then we're giving your cells nutrients, and then we're remeasuring the growth rate of those cells and seeing whether or not that is improved by adding nutrients for the cell to use. And so when we see 
tremendous increases in growth rate of a cell by adding a nutrient. We know that your cells are intracellularly not storing enough of that nutrient. And we know that your cells, these cells that we use have a six month life cycle. So when we see that cell being low in that nutrient, we know it's been going on for at least six months. So it gives us this really long opportunity or this really long window of opportunity to understand what nutrition supplementation is gonna work best for a person as opposed to a serum test. You might eat a steak on the night before your blood draw and now your B12 is coming back looking normal, not because you have adequate amounts of B12 inside your cells. Remember, nutrients work inside cells more than they work inside your serum. So the serum is the delivery for the nutrients to get to your cells, but is the nutrient actually making it into your cell? And that's really fundamentally why it's so important to measure intracellular levels and outcomes. <laughs> what does my diet look like? Meats, vegetables, fruits, some small amounts of nuts periodically, mostly. So any variety of those things. Uh, like for example, for, for lunch, I'm gonna enjoy some, uh, some roast and some carrots. In, in RA for inflammation, do we need to take plain curcumin or curcumin and pi piperine? Um, combination supplement. Can we take collagen supplement for longitudinal ridging of the nails or skin elasticity? You, you can. You can take collagen for your nails and skin elasticity and it may be very um, effective for you. As far as taking curcumin, you're talking about getting turmeric. Um, you know, yes, you can take it with or without the, the pepper. Uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of people out there talking about how the pepper improves absorption of curcumin and turmeric, but there's also research that shows that the anti-inflammatory effects of turmeric and curcumin are elicited as a result of helping the GI tract seal itself. So uh, piperine is not going to do anything for, for that aspect. You know, piperine is going to get turmeric into the blood, but if the goal is to seal the gut. We want to keep that turmeric in the gut to have the the anti leakage effect on the GI tract itself. So, I, I would argue that you know in some cases it's actually better to take turmeric without the piperine or without the uh, bioparine uh, pepper extract as an agent of enhancing absorption. And as a matter of fact, my my turmeric matrix that that uh, that I formulated does not have that. Uh, pepper in it on purpose for that very reason. Red light panel versus red light blanket, which one uh, would you recommend? And too much. Mm, as far as red light panel versus red light blanket, I don't have any experience with any particular blanket brands. Um, so, I'm, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to comment on that because it just wouldn't be fair to any brand. Um, but I, I personally like the platinum LED panels. As far as too much red light therapy, yeah, there is the potential that you could overdo it, but very, very hard to do it. I would just say it's always smartest. It's just an intelligent thing to do to start small as opposed to going long. You know, start, you know, start with, you know, five minutes, 10 and work your way up to 10, 15 and 20. You know, my, myself personally, you know, I'll go as long as 40 minutes with red light therapy. Um, but if the sun is shining, I'd rather use sunlight. You're going to get the red light in the infrared and the near and the far infrared from the sun naturally far better than you can from any kind of red light therapy panel. So if your sun is shining, get the sun. Uh, but if you live in a geographically challenged location in that regard, you know, again, I would go as high as 40 minutes a day. But again, I've built myself up to that and be just being aware that I don't want to do too much and not recognize that I could be hurting myself because just like with any light therapy, it has the potential to damage the skin as well and different people have different tolerances and different skin tones, etc. I like this, so I definitely know I'm grain sensitive. I have COPD and when I quit grain after a week, the wheezing is gone. Eat grain for a couple of days and the inflammation comes back and the wheezing happens again. Thanks for sharing that. Hopefully some of you uh, others out there listening will, will, will take heart to that commentary. 
Is mineral hair analysis comparable to intracellular blood tests? No, mineral hair analysis is a complete waste of money and an absolute scientific fraud as it relates to trying to assess nutrition deficiencies. So it's not something I would recommend at all. Uh, recommendations for osteopenia, support, reversal, already grain-free. Great, so if you're grain-free, um, add physical resistance exercises to your regimen if you haven't already done that. If you're just looking for a really good, solid nutritional bone support product recommendation, I recommend our bone box. It's called the Ultra Bone Box. And uh, there are a number of different minerals in that that aren't typical in, in supplements like strontium and boron. So that would be a recommendation if you're just trying to support good bone density. Why do I have sleep apnea? I'm very lean. There could be a number of reasons why you have sleep apnea. I mean, that would require just generally an, an assessment. I mean, certain nutrient deficiencies could cause sleep apnea. Lack of sunshine could cause sleep apnea. You could have a um, you could have a tongue tie. You could have a small mouth. You could have a non-developed jaw, which closes down your airway when you lie down at night, and so. You know, those all are all things that you could have assessed to help you understand kind of the why behind it. But you don't have to be obese. It's kind of a myth that, that being obese creates sleep apnea only, right? You could be thin and also have sleep apnea because of jaw maladaptation. And this is very common in people with gluten sensitivity because one of the side effects of gluten exposure is lack of jaw development. Uh, and so when that jaw doesn't extend and doesn't grow out fully, it closes, it can close down the airway and close down how you're able to breathe when you lie down and, and your neck gets in that certain position where, again, it just reduces quantity of airflow. Eating meats and vegetables rises my homocysteine. I'm concerned about my diet. I would doubt that it's the meat and vegetables that are elevating your homocysteine. I, I, I would argue that uh, your homocysteine is going up because you have micronutrient deficiencies and your diet's just not cutting it or your GI tract is malabsorbing nutrients from those foods that you're eating. Uh, because you don't, you know, you don't either make enough digestive enzymes or stomach acids to help you break your food down. But homocysteine elevations, most common cause of elevation in homocysteine is B vitamin deficiency. B12, folate, B2, B6 deficiencies can all cause elevations in homocysteine. Uh, and then, you know, there are, there are other nutrients that play a role in its metabolism like methionine and choline and cysteine as well. So um, I wouldn't, I would not at all uh, you know, agree that eating meats and vegetables will rise a person or would give rise to a person's homocysteine levels. There's something else going on there. Uh, I'm circling back. Sorry, just wanted to finish my original comment following up on where you commented about my adrenal uh, stress. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's, the, you know, that product, there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing inherently dangerous or wrong about that product. Now, whether it's going to solve why you have adrenal fatigue, uh, it's not. Those are mostly adaptogens. And um, the fact that they're adaptogens, it can be very helpful, and I'm not going to discourage you from using it, but you got to figure out why your adrenal glands are, are, are not up to speed. And for most people, you know, what, what triggers the adrenal glands to be overworked over time? It's stress, right? And so what constitutes stress? Well, there's different flavors of stress or different varieties of stress. You can have physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress. So assess your relationships, you know, stress your physicality. And, and biochemically speaking, chemical stresses for most people come from the food that they eat or the chemical exposures that they have within the food that they eat or the environmental chemical exposures that they have. So assessing those things honestly is going to give you the best odds at, at um, taking that stress and pressure off of your adrenal glands. Okay, I think we're solid. We've gone an hour and 12 minutes today.
look, I want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays or Happy Hanukkah or whatever it is that you celebrate in your culture. Uh, I wish you well. And we will be back on Tuesday for another episode of Dr. Osborne's Zone. In the meantime, if you are looking for supplements, if you're looking to do some of these lab tests because your doctor refuses to help you, you can check out glutenfreesociety.org. Everything is 15% off right now. So if you want to save some money while you're trying to support your health and support our mission at Gluten Free Society all at the same time, go check out that sale. Otherwise, please do me a favor. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you share this video with someone who could use it. And, uh, and make sure you help share our, mis- our message, which is to save 100 million lives. I can't do it without you guys. You know, Together, we can help more people. Again, Merry Christmas. 